Well, hey guys, welcome back to the channel and welcome back to the BVM Venom F16 1 5th scale build series. We're gonna call it a build, who cares? Uh, we're doing some fun things to this aircraft and the build series starts now. All right guys, if you missed the unboxing of this aircraft, she's awesome. Uh, we did obviously do the unboxing already. There's, uh, well, you should check it out if you missed it, but it's pretty darn cool. So there's the Venom scheme. Uh, we've got a lot of cool things planned for this aircraft, but as per usual in video number one, we want to review what equipment is going inside this plane. So let's take a flip around and take a look at all the equipment that's going in the Venom. Oh, and if you're an avid follower of the channel, well, we got our microphone back and fixed and everything, so the audio should be way better. All right, so here's an overview of all the equipment we've got going in this aircraft. Let's take a look at each individual part or piece or grouping. So we'll start from right to left here. So we've got a pilot from Warbird Pilots. Of course, um, you need a pilot from Warbird Pilots. These things are awesome. No movable head on this one. There's just the, the pilot with white head. We've got a chute from RC Jet Chutes. If you guys have never used one of uh, Paul's chutes, these things are unreal. Uh, if you've got an aircraft that deserves one of these things, I suggest you get one from RC Jet Chutes. Love this stuff. There's some information right there, but uh, these are beautiful pieces of kit here. Uh, just awesome, so nice. Uh, we've got a couple of our fuel fittings right here. Um, we've got a V-Speak uh, unit that pairs up with the sweet wind turbine that we're putting in here. So we'll take a look at that in a second. But uh, the V-Speak is gonna give us our telemetry and fuel consumption on this aircraft. Uh, we've got an SE6 expander and a cable. So this works in conjunction with our central box 210. So I'm not gonna pop that open on camera here, but it's just a standard central box. We're gonna be using an R3 for our on off, and we're using a Rex 7 times two with a 40 centimeter dipole antenna. So that is, one is gonna be the primary, one is set up as a clone. For servos, we are going with uh, different, some, some different MKS servos. So we're doing ailerons on the 9930s for the aircraft. Uh, this is going to be the rudder servo, so this is a 9930 as well. Uh, this is out of the package because we were using it to set up the Bandit, which is the same owner. And we've got the elevator servos, E1, E2, and this is a MKS 599 servo. So these are the servos we're switching out in this aircraft. And the power plant for this aircraft, it's getting a Swiwin 300 Beast. So this is a Special labeled model, uh, serial number 1000. This is the power plant that's gonna be pushing this big girl around. So we will also be installing a uh, V-Speak onboard compressor. That's going in the aircraft as well. Uh, they are en route, they're not here yet, but we've got our next V-Speak order coming. So we've got an order of a bunch of compressors for airplanes that are coming up. So that is also going in this aircraft. All right, so the BVM GoFly package, which is what this aircraft is, you could conceivably put a receiver in, put a engine or power plant in, and you could fly the plane. Now, why are we making these changes? Well, because sometimes uh, people have preferences and sometimes things might be better. Uh, that's why we're making these changes. One of the comments during the unboxing video was why on earth would you change the servos? This aircraft comes with BVM servos. I think those are made by Savix based on the comment from the video. And the owner, David, of this aircraft, all of his aircraft get MKS servos. That's why we're putting MKS servos in the aircraft. Simple as that. So step number one in a build, we have a couple things we need to do. Number one, we need to get our servos cycling and we need to burn those babies in. So what we do is we take our jetty box and with the jetty box, we plug our servo in, paying attention to polarity. We take our battery, we plug our battery in. And what happens is the screen will pop up. Impulse generator, no. Servo cycler, yes. Number of cycles, we just go right to the max, which is 990, and we are going to up this to 500 
whatever that is, the impulse rate, which increases the amount that the servo is traveling. So now we're traveling the full distance. And we will increase the speed, the velocity, to 30. You can go up really high, but I just do all my servos at 30 for 990 cycles for 500 as the travel. So we'll let this run and we're gonna burn in the other four servos as well. The other thing we need to do in any new project is we are going to update our Jetty products. So that is our central box, our two receivers and our R3 for our on off. And we'll check the Cortex, but those are all up to date because they're all new batches. So we'll get all this stuff updated and we will also get a model created in our radio. So the owner, David, uh, he has one of these planes already, uh, has had one of these planes already. So he actually emailed me the program for Jetty. So what I'll do is I'll just take that program from my email, drop it onto my radio, and everything will be already laid out and very, very simple. Now, if you did not have something like this readily available, what I would do with a brand new model is I've got a blank model on my radio. Now, the point of the blank model is it's got a whole bunch of the normal stuff already set up. So I would copy my blank model and start with the Hawk as an example. And I would just add in functions and, and things that are needed to make the Hawk relevant to my blank model. But the point of the blank model is you've got something you can copy that already has 90% of the work done for you. All right, very common question. How long does the servo burn and process take? Uh, it takes about, I think 20-ish minutes per servo. Of course, that's gonna depend on how many cycles and speed and all that, but uh, it takes about 20 minutes is a rough idea. But we just keep this going in the background while we're doing other stuff. Okay, so we have our plane sitting over there. We wanna get that plane sitting over here on our stand so we can have good access to it. Uh, this is something that was sent to me, this flex, flexi spot. Uh, it's actually a standing desk, but we use it in the shop here. I love it because it's adjustable. So you can adjust it from super low to insanely high and anywhere in between. So this is definitely becoming one of my favorite items in the shop. All right, so we had put a few things away in the shipping containers. So the main crate and the wing crate. So we've pulled all that stuff out. So now we've got all of our wings and everything that we had in those crates out. And also we, I forgot to mention this, we have a pipe from JT's, JT's Hobby, which is Joey Tamez. And this is oh, our upgraded pipe for the Beast for the 300. So really nice pipe. Uh, we've got a very thick inner wall. Uh, I'm not sure the size difference compared to the stock pipe, but that thing looks very suitable for the Swewin 300. All right, so this uh, plane does come with a manual. So we will pull this manual out and see what it's all about. I've took a quick gander through it, but uh, let's take a deeper dive into it. All right, so first uh, BVM plug and play, or I believe it's called uh, Go Ready and Fly or something like that uh, project that I've ever, uh, I've ever had here in the shop and easily the best manual out there. So we've got a manual on the GoFly central control unit, talking about gyro sense, plug and play fuel system check, uh, brake servicing, canopy adjustment, and the actual manual, which is all right here. So this uh, a pretty cool setup for sure. This is, uh, is nice to see, so uh, I like it. It's, uh, yeah, it's pretty awesome. So we've got a whole bunch of steps here to follow. Now there are gonna be things about this aircraft that we do not follow. So uh, we will definitely refer to this, but we'll also just refer to our normal procedure. I believe I covered this in the, uh, in the unboxing video, but from BVM, that's where all the stuff came from in a separate envelope. So we got uh, these things, which I think are on the nose cone. Uh, we got a bunch of scale bits here. Uh, these are the, the fuel uh, plug fittings. We're not gonna be using these for the um, the system, so we'll be using a standard uh, DreamWorks vent fitting. Uh, this is to make the little scale uh, pieces. I know that didn't sound very technical, but those little scale pieces that come off of these guys right there on the different surfaces. 
But Kelly made us some, thank you Kelly for this. So he made us some and included a drill bit for them. Made a bunch of them here already. And uh, we also have some hatch latch pieces as well. So these go over the little latch pins like that. We can paint them and they will basically disappear uh, once we've got them painted to match the aircraft. Then on something like this, we could even go as far as painting them just all black, or we could put a little gray stripe on there so they follow the scheme and are almost invisible. All right, so as mentioned previously, we are gonna be kind of working our way through the manual, but uh, we're gonna be stopping and working on various things as we work through this manual, but uh, throughout the process and the, of putting this plane together here, you should see pretty much all the pages of the manual in the videos. So we've pulled the bypass out, the duct that was in there out. We've obviously exposed the fuel tanks. We're gonna pull the braces out here and then we're gonna pull the pipe out. So obviously the pipe is getting changed. Uh, the stock pipe is designed for a 200 to 240 series engine. We're putting a 300 in there. So one thing I'll do with these little braces before I take them out is I just wanna mark which way is forward. And this one is front. So I'll put a little F there. Okay, right there. And this one. And this one forward with an R. Okay, so the stock pipe here, it's got this lip on the back side, so it's uh, very difficult with one person to get this out. So we do have to take the tail cone off anyways. So we took the tail cone off, that's sitting right here. In order to get the tail cone off, uh, you need to be able to get an Allen key in there to undo the keyhole bolts. So we ended up taking the afterburner light off as well. Yes, that makes a heck of a lot more sense. Looks like somebody uh, already tried to install this. Maybe they installed it from the front. I don't know, but that's pretty crinkled. Okay, so there's the stock pipe. It is a very thick pipe. I'm actually, I'm curious, let's weigh this compared to the new pipe and see what the actual weight difference is. Okay, so stock pipe, very, very big size difference. We'll measure this here shortly. So stock pipe, 789 grams. Aftermarket pipe, which is massive, 811 grams. So we are uh, 22 grams heavier on the aftermarket pipe. So a huge size difference. You can see it there. It is massive size difference. But that's what happens when you go up to a 300 size turbine. Uh, you really do need a big pipe. So let's measure the, uh, the output diameters or internal uh, measurement there. Okay, so stock pipe is three and 15 sixteenths, which I think is four inches. We'll just go in millimeters here. So 100 millimeters for the stock pipe and the aftermarket pipe. 121 millimeters. So you're basically five inches, almost five inches on the, uh, the aftermarket pipe. That is a huge difference. And there's a shot from this perspective as well. So obviously we got to make some pretty significant changes to our tail cone piece here. So we're going to have to get rid of almost all of those little tabs there. But of course we'll measure that and make sure we get the right amount. Okay, so this is pretty much the easiest way to get this uh, set up. So we've got the tail cone sitting here put the pipe on top of the tail cone. And you can see there, we are basically getting rid of the tabs uh, and the pipe's gonna be resting on the entire ring, which is totally fine. Uh, the afterburner light also has a little bit of a space. So we're gonna have probably five millimeter space between the inside of the afterburner ring and the new pipe. So that was well thought out and should work Awesome. So we've got a whole bunch of dust inside this aircraft as well. Uh, it actually was making me sneeze like crazy. So we're gonna pull the vacuum out and uh, give it a cleaning in the back end here, but there's lots of dust. Uh, I wouldn't recommend not doing that step. Um, so there's a shot of what it looks like as soon as you get the pipe out. So everything's nicely run. We've got airlines run for our air brakes here. 
they're run on both sides. Right, so we've pulled off the vertical stab to get access to our back end here. So what we're doing is we're doing a couple things initially on this aircraft. So the first thing we're gonna focus on is the back end. So we're going to be changing our elevator servos like we've talked about. We're gonna be changing our rudder servo like we've talked about. We're gonna be putting a chute on here as well too. Uh, lots to do on this aircraft. So what we need to do is pull this whole area apart here and get access to our stuff. Okay, so we've got our four screws undone here. Uh, now the servo arm is added on after this whole contraption is installed. So we'll have to pull the servo arm off. There we go. And now, perfect. So that should come off nicely. Awesome. So one of our big challenges with the back end here is the chute mechanism. So that's ultimately probably our, our biggest challenge of this whole area. Now we do have some pictures to kind of go off of from the previous F-16 that the owner had. And, uh, but we will be, I mean, the first thing we're doing here is changing the servo out. So that's like a, a simple, obvious thing that we're doing. But uh, we're gonna take a look at this and see what, uh, as far as planning goes, how we're going to organize the chute mechanism in this area. Let's take a close look here at what we wanna do with our chute mechanism. So first of all, the width of this entire piece is not wide enough to put a chute on. So what we're looking for is kind of like this in line with my screwdriver, so if we're uh, 35 millimeters back here. We want to be about 30 up front here, or I guess at the back. Um, so we want this to be more straight. And the other thing we need to do is we need to create a bigger space. So it's natural to use our panel line here, create another panel line here, take this light, move that light down, but essentially make a bigger section in the back here. So. How are we going to do that? Well, I'm gonna take some measurements with this and I'm gonna look at uh, making a 3D printed uh, mold is my goal here. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. I don't know how that's gonna work, but if I can make a 3D printed uh, mold or plug, then we can fill the inside and we can line it with fiberglass and hopefully make something that is really close to, uh, to what we have here. That's my goal anyways. Um, I'm gonna try and use 3D printing to do this. We'll see how that all works out. So I'm gonna go play around with the 3D printer software and see what we can come up with. All right, so we're gonna print the first tail plug here. Um, pretty simple, what I did was I just made the shape that I wanted. So it's, uh, I mean, it, it's uber simple. It's 40 wide at the base. 35 wide at the uh, the end and it's just the length and whatever that we need so we're using the chidi printer because the bamboo was tied up uh, when we were starting it otherwise i probably would have used the bamboo printer that is definitely my favorite between the two it's like uber simple and just works but we'll see how the chidi does and uh anyways the goal for this is we want to try and make a plug to make our tail work so here's my thought process for the tail. My first thought was to 3D print this piece. The downside with that is um, we'd have to do some treatment to the outside, make sure we're happy with it. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna go with kind of a traditional uh, fiberglass type setup. So the simplest way for me, because I'm not super familiar with CAD, is to make a shape that we want to replace this piece that we're gonna cut out. So that's the next thing we're gonna do, is we're gonna cut this out here, cut it out here, and the plug that we are printing, ideally is fitting on here, and it's the right shape of what we're looking for. Now I didn't radius the corners or the edges of the plug that we're building, so I printed it five uh, layers wide, so we've got a little bit of sanding room. So if that works out perfect, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that piece, we're gonna build a plug for it, 
we just have to wait for that to print. So it's like two and a half hours or three hours to print that. So that's what we're waiting for with the printer. All right, so the machine is printing away. We've got uh, three layers done, a whole lot more to go. So we're just printing this in basic uh, PLA Tough uh, from Bamboo Studio or Bamboo Labs. And I uh, can't really give you a good shot there, but anyways, we'll see it when it comes out and uh, we'll take a close look at it. So next thing we wanna do is we wanna make our cut for our uh, cutout here that we're doing for our shoot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark this out in Sharpie, I think. And uh, we're basically just taking this as a straight line and uh, using that. So fairly straightforward using the panel line, creating a panel line and we're gonna make that cut. So we're making that cut in preparation for our 3D printed piece. All right, it's cut time. So we've marked this out with Sharpie. I'm gonna take some uh, masking tape and run masking tape along our lines as well. And we're gonna get that section cut out. And there's a shot of just finished cutting it. So we're gonna pull our tape off and waiting for the 3D print. All right, so while we are waiting for our shoot mechanism to print, we're gonna continue on the back end here. So first thing we need to do is we need to go in and loosen up all of our items back here. So we've got airline, we've got light lines, we've got servo lines, all of that stuff needs to be heat protected. So we'll do that, but first we need to take our rudder servo out and get that guy set up. Then we're gonna take our air brakes out and Loctite all the items on the air brakes and confirm that we're happy there. So lots of stuff to do in the back end here as well. So we'll pull our servo out first. Now that servo line comes all the way down to this connection point right here. So that's another reason why we need to loosen up all of our zip ties holding everything in place. As we go through this aircraft, every change that I'm making is a change that I'm doing because I don't feel comfortable with the stock setup. Lots of people are buying these aircraft, throwing an engine in them, doing a few things that the manual says, putting a receiver in and flying them. Totally awesome. That's good. I'm happy you guys are having success with that. All the things that we cover in this aircraft though are just those little changes that in my mind, make it better. So one of those things is the servo connectors here. Now I thought that was shrink tubing, but it is not. It is just like a piece of tape. Additionally, back here, there's this uh, piece of tape holding all of the connectors down. Uh, we're just gonna yank that off, but this is the tape that they're using at the servo connectors. So uh, not good. Uh, we're gonna remove all those pieces of tape on all those servo connectors that are exposed and we are gonna put some shrink tubing on those. But we do have to take that off anyways because that's our servo connector for the rudder. So dimensionally, the servos are gonna be very similar, but uh, I just wanna point out here quality-wise between how these two things fit. So the, the MKS servo obviously is a little bit deeper in the base, but there's lots of room in the aircraft for that. Uh, this servo arm slips on and off that very easy on the BVM servo, which is a Savix servo. Um, the MKS servo really needed to press that servo arm onto the splines. Both have a Futaba spline, but way more accurate fit on the MKS servo. When, uh, when you take this arm and you put it on the BVM servo, it actually has a little bit of play. So those are some of the reasons to just uh, keep this type of thing in mind. Not the be all end all, but those things do matter. All right, so we've got our 9930 rudder servo screwed into place. One thing I like to do with uh, stuff like this is before I put those screws in, I'll put a drop of thin CA into the screw hole and that's gonna do two things. Number one, it's gonna harden up the wood. Number two, it's gonna lock those servo screws in place. Uh, you can get them out, but they're gonna take a little bit of a pop to get loose. That ensures they do not come out. All right, so we're making some good progress here on the 3D printer. And if you look closely, you can see we've got a bit of an angle coming to the top, right? So the base is 40 millimeters. The top, when it's done printing, is 35. So it's got just a slight angle to each side. All right, servo arm here. I did uh, take the screw off the back and double check it. 
and I uh, just wanted to make sure they use Loctite. They did use Loctite, but we will check them, of course, on the other surfaces. All right, so the air brakes are pretty easy to take out. There's two bolts that hold them in place right on the ends. There's little slots right there. And uh, as soon as you do that, the air brake essentially just separates from the fuselage. Now, there's a couple of things that I really wanted to inspect here. Number one, and again, we're comparing this to some of the SkyMaster kits that I've put together. Number one, when I looked at this, I'm like, ooh, there's just a bushing that this surface is riding on. That's a huge concern. Well, there is actually bearings inside here. So there's a, a, a carrier that fits between these two blocks. The shaft slides into that carrier and there's a bearing on this side and a bearing on that side. So our elevators or horizontal stabs are actually running on bearings. The bushing is just there as our, uh, our last centering piece here. That's really nice to see, I'm, I'm happy for that. So uh, the reason we're taking the air brakes apart is because we wanna make sure we service everything. We wanna make sure we Loctite everything. So we are gonna check things like the bolts holding this whole unit in place. Now those fasteners against the, uh, the, the former work right here, they're holding the air brake in place, they're holding the horizontal stab in place, really important stuff. The other reason we're doing this with the air brakes, and we'll do this with everything, is we wanna make sure we're servicing our cylinders and we're Loctiting everything on this unit along with the gear and everything. So I pulled this out here, there's no Loctite on it. These are all those fittings and fasteners and everything that will loosen up over time if you do not Loctite them. Any metal to metal contact needs to be Loctited, super important. So what we'll do here is we're just gonna uh, Loctite all of our four fasteners, our primary ones first. We're gonna put a couple drops of silicone oil on each side of the cylinder. So there's one side, two sides. Now these air fittings are actually really, I, I was concerned with them at first, but they're a nice setup. So to get them off, you just grab the little metal bit with pliers, pull them off and they, and they work really well. So we can just snip off a little bit of air line there, install the air line. And if you're running the little metal piece up where my thumb is, you just push it over top of the fitting. So actually pretty cool little fittings. All right, so we got both of our air brakes serviced, dealt with. They're sitting beside the plane, ready to be reinstalled. Uh, I cut the light from the previous piece. So this is our cutout piece. The light was down here. Now the light will need to be moved to this area right there. So I saved as much as possible of the mount and uh, we will end up installing that right there. But I think we'll do that as an afterthought uh, or an after uh, thing once we get everything done with the shoot mechanism. And I just want to give a shout out to Rob and Barb in Perth, Australia. Like as far away from me as you can possibly get on the other side of the world. Uh, Rob just called while I was working on the F-16. He's working on a scratch build F-16 right now. Thanks guys for watching. I know you'll be watching this video. So it's getting cold here in Canada. You guys are getting warm, lucky. And here's a little shot of our uh, 3D printed piece so you can better see the angle now. And we've got uh, nine minutes left. So our 3D piece is done. Um, I did a little bit of sanding to level these surfaces out a little bit. And you can see there, it worked out beautifully. So our width is pretty much bang on perfect. Um, the, the overall shape of it and everything is awesome. So our dimensions are great here, uh, this side here, it's, you can see it sticks out a little bit. So once this is all done, it just needs to be squished in when we fiberglass it all on. So what's the process here? So what we're going to need to do is we need to round out our edges. Uh, to make it look like it belongs on the aircraft. This is all not gonna be in this episode. It's gonna be in succession on the upcoming episodes, but at least we got this started, underway, and you'll have to watch the other episodes to work through the rest of this process. Okay, so what I did here was undid the four bolts holding the elevator horizontal stab system in place. And what that does is that allows the elevator servo to come out. Now this is a heck of a lot easier to work on with it out of the plane like this versus trying to do up those Allen keys and everything while it's in the plane. So that's why we're gonna do 
what I'm doing right here. And that also allows us to Loctite these fasteners. These fasteners were not Loctited. If you're buying this plane, you must take it apart and Loctite everything. It's so important guys, so important. All right, so elevator servos, the MKSs are essentially just a drop in replacement. Uh, again, the arm fits a little bit tighter on the MKS servo than the BVM servo. Um, I did take my calipers and take this measurement on the BVM servo just to confirm that when the MKS servo is installed, we're close and we're within a millimeter of the end of the ball. So uh, it's, it, everything lines up just beautifully. So uh, there was no Loctite holding the original fasteners for the servo down. So we will of course Loctite the fasteners for the servo to the aluminum mount. All right, not intentional, but trustees here helping us out getting servo arms and stuff off. Uh, so we've Loctited those uh, fasteners in place. Uh, there's a little bit of play in the servo uh, when you're putting this together. So I just made sure that our profile was even on both sides of the servo before we did those up. So this is one of those things that I think is pretty darn cool compared to something like the Skymaster. So the Skymaster kit, you are um, fastening your servo into plywood, which uh, is fine, but this is a pretty nice setup. Um, I, I think it's great compared to, uh, compared to the Skymaster alternative. Uh, the one thing I don't like about this is the fact that BVM has listed this as a go fly package, bind and fly type thing. And uh, you don't have things like the, uh, the Loctite done on an important thing like this. So um, just trying to be honest with you guys, but uh, I will share the positives and negatives compared to a uh, typical SkyMaster jet, as I've mentioned, as we go through this. So this is now ready to go back in. We've Loctited everything. Uh, we've checked the back here. This is Loctited from the factory. So the arm to the bolt right there, that has been Loctited, which is nice. Uh, but if your servo comes loose, that doesn't help. So one of the last things I did here is I just put a little drop of CA on this side of the threads. Uh, that's just gonna give it one little layer of protection against backing out, but we've Loctited those in place and CA'd them on that side. All right, and I feel like it's been a while since we've had a tip time. So this tip time has been brought to you by a trusty bent screwdriver. Trusty says when you get an ARF, when you get a plane, when you get a used plane, when you get a new plane, Make sure you're using this little bottle of stuff or get yourself a big bottle because you'll never not use it while well, you should be using it. So uh, guys, it is on a serious note, it is very important to make sure that you are Loctiting uh, an aircraft like this. Uh, don't assume that the manufacturer is doing that for you. I preach that on every build we do here in the shop. Uh, my goal in all of this is to share knowledge um, that a lot of people hold on to way too tightly. And I have only come across one aircraft that has had everything Loctited from the manufacturer. Otherwise, it always needs to be done. So any metal to metal contact, always take it apart and Loctite it. So that's your tip time for this episode. All right, and that is going to wrap up video number one in the build series of the BVM 1 5th scale Venom F-16 aircraft. Uh, been fun so far. It's interesting to see the differences between this Jet Legend aircraft and a Skymaster aircraft. That's gonna be one of the most, probably for me, the most fun parts about this entire project. Uh, we do have some really good progress coming on the aircraft already, of course. It doesn't really seem like we got a lot done, but we're figuring out a lot of the little details. Uh, the next video, we will continue with the rear chute mechanism and just keep working our way forward. So stay tuned for that. If you guys have any questions or comments, make sure you list them down below. If you have anything you want to reach out to me on, you can reach me at thelightersideofrc at gmail.com. That's it guys, thank you so much for watching and we will see you in the next video.